Hey, Green Machine friends and fans of fun, uh, we are one year old! Hooray! Hooray! Uh, so yeah, we've been doing this for a year and our anniversary was August 11th and we had like, I don't know, finger foods and some candy in the store and stuff and it was pretty fun. Um, but we got a lot of books to get through. It was honestly a really good week for comics. Like, I gotta tell you, like... Both writers and artists seem to be banging it out of the park these days. Like, comics are just amazing right now. So, we have a stack. Like, I literally have to read a, a novel's worth of comics. Oh, God. First world complaints here. Um, anyways, but I got my caffeine. Um, it is by will alone that I set my mind in motion. And uh, Yogi's already heard that joke twice. Um, but, so we're going to get through the comics... Um, the first one is You're the Villain, Dark Gifts, and that is for Superman. And we're actually showing you the variant cover for Superman, which is the ever-lovely Crypto. And the reason for that is uh, both Superman and Supergirl comics are sort of being recalled right now because they have spoilers on the cover, I guess is what it is. So if you can find them, go pick them up. Uh, we... we may or may not have some on the shelf tomorrow, so rush on down. Diamond said to destroy them. Diamond said to destroy them. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> um, but anyway, so Super Superman was this... Well, I gotta tell you, I haven't been reading Superman, um, but was this amazing? It was amazing. It was outstanding. Um, the House of L is standing with the House of Zod, which is not something you see all that often and on top of that they're starting the space un yeah oh, united nations of, the of space sort of yeah the united planets of whatever Federation. interstellar yeah they're starting star trek is what they do <laughs> but uh, no 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 it was one it was really cool to see two it i mean it, it was just awesome to see the house of l standing with the house of zod in like full glory and uh, them backing their play, too. So it was nice to see. If you haven't been following Superman, basically what's happened is uh, both... I think Supergirl figured it out first. But somebody, somehow they figured out that uh, Krypton had been destroyed. Um, that a lot of people had the hand had a hand in the destruction of uh, Krypton, including the Guardians of... Uh, uh, the Guardians from uh, Gre the Green Lantern Corps. So, like, there, there, it has been, like, a wild ride. I don't know how many books has it been. It's been, like, 20 books for, like, Supergirl and Superman, having fi figured all this stuff out and, and pretty much going down the line. Uh, so it's been a while. And uh, this is pretty much the wrap-up, but it was a really cool wrap-up. It was, it was, honestly, it was something to see that was quite awesome. So uh, if you're a Superman fan, you need to jump in here. Uh, it wasn't terribly confusing as someone who hasn't been, like, caught up in a few books. I, I, I didn't have a, a too hard of a time with it. But there is some iconic stuff to see in this book. So I really think that uh, Superman number 14, you, you probably need to go pick up. So I guess it's been 14 books for Superman. But... <laughs> For Supergirl, it feels like a long time, because she got that axe, remember? Yeah. yeah and right. that was a long time ago. Like, we jumped in with that pretty much at the beginning when we opened yeah. the store. Like a year ago, so yeah. Uh, next book we're going to go over is Ironheart. That's Riri Williams, and if you can't tell from the cover, she's hanging out, out with Shuri and Wakanda, and I loved it. I loved every everything about this book. Um, the art was amazing. The writing was amazing. More importantly, uh, who, who are the writers? Uh, oh, Ewing. Oh, it's Ewing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he, he writes characters really well, and uh, that, that really shows in this. Because, I don't know, when you, when you take two type A personalities of Riri Williams and Shuri, and they meet, and then more importantly, they meet on Shuri's turf, of course they're going to clash a little. They're going to they're, they're gonna butt heads a little. They're both a little proud and a little stubborn at times. And uh, that, that's, that's what shows. But... You know, it plays out like it should. Eventually, they unite and they take on the, the, the big bad in this story. And more importantly, there's there's an appearance of a character I haven't seen in a long time. An actual uh, disabled hero I haven't seen in a long time. So I really, really think you need to go check out this book. Um, I mean, Ironheart is, is a pretty darn good showing these days anyways. And anything with Shuri, in my opinion, is amazing. So go check this out. Ironheart number nine. Uh, Marvel fans, get on that. Next is Doctor Who, the 13th Doctor. And uh, so, as somebody who does not know Doctor Who, what, what, what is Doctor Who again? A time... 
<coughs> a Time Lord. Okay. Doctor Who is a Time Lord, and through this book, I found out that there is another Time Lord. There are many. There are many, and apparently, uh, as as the Thirteenth Doctor has put it, um, you know, there are there are good and bad people of every species, even humans, and even Time Lords. And she was explaining that to one of her friends. So I'm kind of that's clearly foreshadowing. Whoa, yeah. Whoa. The name like Master or Missy? Uh, the name I don't know. She dresses like a pirate. Oh, oh. okay. Kind of piratey. Interesting. So I I don't know this character. Um, uh, I could probably give you a name if you give me a second. Her name is. For Doctor Who fans, the Master or Missy is up there. She looks like this. Okay. okay, okay. so no idea who this character is, but uh, it does sort of loop back onto the first person that Doctor Who kind of dealt with in this comic, the first big bad that they dealt with, showing that, you know, time uh, is definitely not linear when you're dealing with Time Lords, and that, that was kind of fun to see. Um, but, like, as somebody who's not a giant Doctor Who fan and has skipped a few issues, I was a little... Well, I, I like Doctor Who... I just uh, have trouble jumping in after missing some stuff, I guess is how I would say it. So if you're a Doctor Who fan, I think you'd have a perfectly good time with this book. Um, and the art is always on point. Even these covers are amazing, too. Like, all, everything about the, the art and Doctor Who is great. The writing is good, too. Um, I had no problems with it. I, I don't think it was confusing at all. It just... Uh, well, I missed a few issues. So, anyways, Doctor Who issue number eleven. Man, I've missed a lot of issues because I think the last time I reviewed was like four. Yeah. So I missed quite a few. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, Doctor Who issue number eleven. It's a good issue. If you like Doctor Who, jump in. If you if you don't like Doctor Who, you don't know it. You don't know about it. You want to try it? You go jump in. It's pretty good. Uh, next is a book that kind of caught me by surprise because I knew nothing about this book, and that is uh, Once and Future. And honestly, this is an amazing book. Now, we're going to talk about some spoiler stuff, because you really can't talk about it in issue one without talking about some spoiler stuff. So I'm going to set the stage a little. But uh, basically, there's a woman in a nursing home, and she's kind of old, and she goes off for a smoke and then decides to run off. And her grandson gets a call, and she says, you know, I've ran off from the nursing home. Come pick me up. And he goes to pick her up and comes to find out she has a weapons arsenal. And he, like, picks up this giant gun with all this stuff mounted on it, and he's like... What, what is this for? And she's like, killing vampires? But we don't need that right now. And, and it goes from there. So it, it's basically, uh, I guess his grandma had been doing fighting about mystical things and dealing with magical creatures. And she even at one point says like, well, that, it seems like nonsense. And he's like, yeah, but I just saw that creature. And she's like, yeah, a lot of things that exist are still pretty nonsensical. <laughs> and it was, it was pretty great. Like I, the writing is really good. The art is amazing. Uh, the, it centers around a certain mystical sword, but not really because the sword wasn't mystical. The scabbard was mystical, apparently. And uh, yeah, I liked everything about this. Um, Once in Future by Boom Studios, uh, and this is uh, Kieran Gillen, Dan Mora, and Tamara Bonvilla. Go pick this up. This was an excellent, excellent showing. And I don't think we have enough copies of this either. But uh, it's it's basically fantasy in modern world stuff. And they're sort of setting the stage with prophecy. And more importantly, uh, uh, Granny can fight. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so go check this out. Once in Future, pretty good showing. Honestly, if I had to pick an indie pick of the week, uh, that would be it for sure. Um Next is Absolute Carnage Separation Anxiety. I think this is the main cover. Is this the main cover or the variant? I think it's the main, main cover. cover yeah. Okay. Separation Anxiety. This centers around uh, Agony, Lasher, uh, Riot, and what's the other symbiote? Do you remember the others? I don't remember the other symbiote. I can never remember all the Life Foundation names. I was calling them Life Syndicate. I got it confused with something else. And so this is the Life Foundation symbiotes. If you don't know, they all... I thought they were dead, but I, I seem to remember they merged into a dog at one point, and that dog ran around with Deadpool while Deadpool was riding a Tyrannosaurus. I didn't dream this, did I? This was this really happened. This really happened. Um, but at any rate, so the dog itself is found by, like, a random kid. The kid brings it into his house. His parents are fighting. And then the dog unleashes the symbiotes. And these are not 
happy things. These symbiotes are very, very twisted. And uh, they're all a little warped because of Null, but pretty much, yeah, you go from there. Uh, what I will tell you, and I, I will preface this for you, um, honestly, it's a cool story. I, I was, it was really cool to see the symbiotes bond to new people. However, this felt like Cross to me. Like, this felt like Garth Ennis's Cross, like a very very dark and twisted horror story that eventually works out with people getting symbiotes but in a pretty messed up way so if you like horror this is totally your jam and granted we knew we were going to get some horror with the absolute carnage event it's pretty much unavoidable but uh wow this was at times it almost felt over the top so uh good showing who, who wrote this oh chapman Chapman, Level, and Boyd. Uh, so good showing, guys. Uh, Absolute Carnage. Everything about Absolute Carnage as an event so far has been great. And Separation Anxiety about the uh, Life Foundation symbiotes is no different. Go pick this up. Um, next is Vox... Vox... I'm going to pronounce it wrong. Vox Machina or Vox Machina. Uh, and that's the Critical Role story. So if you don't know Critical Role, Critical Role is a group of... Uh, Dungeons and Dragons uh, are peers, but more importantly, they do it on, uh, what is it, Geek and Sundry? Geek and Sundry. And uh, it's a really, really good show. As somebody who doesn't play Dungeons and Dragons until next week, <laughs> it's going to be my first time playing. But as somebody who doesn't play Dungeons and Dragons, uh, I have a fun time even watching that show. And uh, they're obviously master storytellers, and it shows. And Matt, Matthew Mercer, who I think is the DM from the show, I think is the DM, uh, he's at the helm for writing this. It's a great showing. Honestly, this is some of the best fantasy storylines. Like, this was entertaining as hell. Like, Rat Queen's level entertaining. So, uh, yeah, you really need to go check this out if you like fantasy. And it's... There are times where some fantasy in the store feels a little bit generic. Because, I, I don't know, comic fantasy at times does that. Like, it gets tropey at times for whatever reason. Uh, and usually it's indie books that do it. This is not the case. This is an excellent showing from Dark Horse. So totally go check this out if you like fantasy. And in fact, there's another book that is a really good uh, fantasy showing this week. So I'll, I'll get to that eventually. Uh, next is the Absolute Carnage Scream uh, story. And this one, man, there is wild cards galore. So originally Scream was attached to, what was her name? Deborah Diego, I think it was. Donna Diego. I think it was Donna Diego. So originally Scream was attached to Donna Diego. We're talking about Absolute Scream. Uh, or no, we're talking about Scream and the Absolute Carnage event. Um, she's going to get detached to somebody else who had the Venom symbiote at one point. Uh, I can't for the life of me remember her name. But that puts her on sort of the warpath with Mania. And Mania herself does not have the, the Mania symbiote. Her, what's her actual name? I think it's uh, Andy? I think it's Andy, Andy Benton. Uh, so Andy Benton doesn't have the Mania symbiote anymore, but she does have something else where she can, like, summon Hellfire portals and stuff to uh, pretty much hell. And she gets, like, a fiery pentagram on her chest, which pretty much makes her the antithesis of symbiotes. Like, she can mess them up. And uh, so that sort of scream is sort of on a warpath with her. And that's what this book is about. So I probably spoiled too much, and I'm sorry if I did. But uh, it's, that, that doesn't change anything. The art is amazing. It was a pretty good story. I've always kind of liked Scream. I like her, her uh, I like Scream's, uh, I guess, color and, and look. Uh, I don't know, man. Like, I, I like Iron Fist's look, and I can't explain it because I don't like Iron Fist much as a character. But uh, his look is really aesthetically pleasing to me, and I think Scream is the same way. It's, for whatever reason, those kind of yellow and, and the way it flows and everything. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, Scream number one. The art is a good showing. The writing, mm, the writing was a little so-so at times. I mean, it's... It, I, I don't know, for whatever reason, it felt a little tropey at times. But it's Bun, Sandoval, Nava, uh, Ar 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 I can't pronounce this name. A-R-C-I-N-E-A-R-C-I-N-I-E-G-A. -I, -E -E I can't even read right now. That's Arkinega? I can't pronounce that name. I'm sorry. Uh, but anyways, it's a good showing. And it, if you like Absolute Carnage, you should be on board for this anyways because you're only going to get so many of these books. But um, uh, I, I would say so far this is the weakest of the Absolute Carnage books. Uh, next is Collapser. And if 
It, this is DC's Young Animal imprint. This is by uh, Mikey Way, Sean Simon, Elias Kiriazis, uh, K- and Chris Peter. Um, it's basically about a character who gets a black hole in his chest that can suck things up, and it can suck himself up and teleport him to different places. And he keeps winding up teleporting to weird places like Loch Ness and like the Bermuda Triangle and all these places that center around mysteries. And it's not quite explained, and, and frankly, I, I don't know if the Collapser is a new or an old character. Have you ever heard of the Collapser? I think it's a new character. Um, but somehow his reality is sort of tied to an alternate reality that is very similar, and he starts seeing that reality. And so, is it interesting? Yeah, oh yeah, it's totally interesting. Uh, however, I'm still a little confused, and I think that's, that's on purpose. I think you're supposed to be confused at this point in the story. But it seems like Collapsor's about to belt out. So go check this out. It wasn't a terrible showing. Um, if you need a new superhero in your life, go check out DC's Young Animal Collapsor. I, I, just, it's, I don't think it's my hero is what I'm going to say. It's not really my hero. But it doesn't mean it's a bad showing. Next book on our list is Reaver. Uh, <clears throat> Reaver, in case you didn't know, uh, what was it last time? It was like they did the dirty dozen of fantasy. Like, they had all these characters that were locked up, and they're like, well, we're going to poison you, and then you're going to need this antidote, and you have to get the antidote every 24 hours. And if you, if you complete this mission, we will set you free, and we will cure you. But if you try to run off, you're going to die from this poison. And that's pretty much the premise of this. And it was like they took a, a team of Dirty Dozen. Um, a whole bunch of them had different skills. Like one was a sorcerer and could use magic. And another one was like a guy who was sort of a coward on a battlefield, which I might work out to be a thief, I think. And then, uh, you know, there was a barbarian who was really tough. And the most interesting character was something called a Reaver. And the Reaver... The, the, I think, I think that was her name, Reaver Skin Eater or something. But she eats skin, and that's how she, like, uh, knows someone's life. Which is a very... That's like necromancy, isn't it? Yeah. yeah it sounds like necromancy. Anyways, she looks really cool. I mean, she kind of reminded me of, like, the Reavers of uh, Firefly, I think it was. Um, but yeah, Reaver, is it still a good showing? Oh, absolutely. Uh, this is the second fantasy book on the list this week. Actually, there was a lot of good fantasy. I remember another one that was good. But uh, this one is a good showing. They basically uh, wind up in the wilderness and have to deal with uh, some rival tribes that are pissed off at them and, you know, trying to kill them. And so they're sort of navigating that. But it's just a good showing. It feels like a nice quest. It's written well. The character interactions are perfect. The art is is great. I mean, last time I was sort of on the fence about the art. I'm totally off the fence. Uh, This is uh, Image Skybound, and it's Justin Jordan, Rebecca Isaacs, and Alec uh, Gomares. Uh, it's a really, really good story so far, so go check out Reaver. Plus, you get this bonus map on the back. Uh, <laughs> what's, the, what's the map of? Just the hey, it's the map of uh, Gondomeg of Madaris. I have no idea what that is. That's mm. where they're at, I guess. <laughs> okay. uh, next is a book that kind of sucked, and I'm sorry. Uh, that is Titan's Burning Rage. I really wanted to like this, but I don't know. It's Jurgen's... Uh, Rapmund and Sinclair. Uh, I didn't really identify with the story. I don't know. I I want a feeling of the old Titans. Uh, and this, for whatever reason, didn't quite feel like a Titan story at times. Um, and then they were dealing with a character called uh, the Disruptor. And he can disrupt anything. And Does that sound like an awesome character to you? Not, yeah. eh, not really. Like, like Raven casts a spell and he's like, I disrupted your spell. Beast Boy's in a form, and he's like, I disrupted your form. It's, it's, like, it's like when you're playing with, with kids, and they're like, yeah, yeah, I've magicked it off. Well, how'd you do that? Magic? <laughs> it's like, oh, what? <laughs> so, I, I don't know, and I have a sneaky suspicion that Disruptor is not a new character, but he's just not a character I know, because he feels like the Scrambler from, uh, what is it, the, uh, the uh, Wonder Twins. The main bad guy for the Wonder Twins, the Scrambler that can swap bodies, feels exactly like the Disruptor, which leads me to believe that I think the, the Scrambler is a parody of the Disruptor character. But uh, I, I can't confirm that. Um, it just sort of feels that way. However, uh, is this a good Titans book? Mm, not particularly. It wasn't my jam. Um, 
I, I don't know. It wasn't my jam. It is it is kind of like the OG team, which is nice to see. Um, something felt off about the writing. I'm not quite sure what it was. The art was it was okay, um, but uh, I don't know. If you're a Titans fan, you might be happy with this. But I, I never like telling people not to buy a book. But unless you're a diehard Titans fan, this one's wholly skippable. I'm sorry. Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> um. Let's see, Batman Detective Comics, and this, of course, is Tomasi, Deuce, and Guerrero. Um, so this, by the cover, you would think that it's it has to do with Mr. Freeze, and part of it does, but that's that's mostly the end. Uh, most of this book actually centers around uh, centers around Deadshot and Batman, and more importantly, it's kind of a Batman sort of gets cornered as Bruce Wayne uh, on a on a plane of all places so yeah that's kind of a wild situation we don't get to see too often although batman doesn't usually doesn't have the best luck with planes at the beginning of rebirth he was on a plane that was going down he was like on top of it but then he got rescued by gotham girl in, in gotham so what's his name his name was gotham yeah yeah that was man that was so long ago though so i guess he does have good luck with planes because they saved him then but anyways so uh yeah that happens in this book and uh um you shouldn't fight on planes that's all i'm gonna say uh beyond that i can't say too much was it a good read it was it was okay uh i think they're building towards something so they're kind of setting the stage but did it kind of feel like nah i felt a little like filler but if you're like me and you love Batman and you love Detective Comics, you'll probably be perfectly happy with this. Uh, if you're not, I don't think this is the book for you to jump in on. I think wait a wait an issue maybe, because um, this one was mm, sort of it was okay. Next is Ghosted in L.A. or as we're calling a uh, real world no. paranormal activity. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because if you're picked to live in a house with seven strangers, six of whom are ghosts, <laughs> true story. So uh, is that what this is? Yeah, that's that's what this is. This is, I, I can totally see this in the pitch room where they're, they're in the pitch room for Boombox and they're like, okay, hear me out. Real world, but instead of people, uh, most of them are ghosts. And they're like, ah, oh, brilliant. Let's, let's go and make this book. And uh, is it brilliant? No, not really. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a book. Um, I, I didn't hate it. It's kind of slice, slice of life and unlife, I guess you could say. Um, there was a couple things they did that I thought was really funny. They had a really obnoxious male character. And uh, what, what kind of name would you give an obnoxious male character? Think of a crappy name. Chad. Chad. Chad's a good name for an obnoxious male character. No, no. This one they named him Brent. Not Brent. Brent with an I. Which I thought was the most obnoxious name I've never heard. Apologies to all the Brents below. I'm sure there's one of them. Uh, Brent. So, uh, yeah, good old Brent was obnoxious and he got a little handsy with the girl. And what do you think happened in this storyline where Brent got handsy with the girl? Yeah. Maybe. I mean, maybe... Ghost stepped in. You don't know. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, and, and then we need to talk about terrible names because Brent is the worst name ever. And I, God help me, I hope I never meet a Brent. But I also think Chad sucks too. Can we talk about this? Every Chad I've ever known, and you knew me when I knew a Chad back in the day. Every Chad I've ever known has been like really annoying and obnoxious and I couldn't stand him. And, and I think that we should outlaw the name Chad for anyone that is not Chad Boswick. He's the only one that can be Chad. Like everyone else, if your name is Chad, just pick a new name. There's always an exception to the rules. That's it. Chad Boswick is the Boswick is the only Chad we need, and the rest of you Chads are now outlawed. Go pick a new name. You could be Frank. Frank is a good strong name. There you go. Yeah. Uh, next, we're gonna talk about Batman Universe, and so we need to talk about Superman up in the sky for a second, because who's writing Superman up in the sky? Be my boy, Tom King. That would be Tom King. Tom King, what, one of my favorite writers. And uh, I noticed that Batman Universe is being written by Bendis, Brian Michael Bendis. And uh, he's writing Superman, and Tom King's writing Batman, and they switched. They've switched heroes. And I don't know if that's intentional. I hadn't looked into these books all that often. But I got to tell you, what is happening in Batman Universe 
uh, might be related to what is going on with Superman up in the sky. And I can't confirm, but if you know DC, you know there are two warring space factions. Well, they warred at one time. And one of them had Adam Strange as a, a representative, and that was Ronian, and the other one is who? Hawkman. Oh, God. Sanagarian. And so, I don't know. I don't know if they're going to cross over, but I got to tell you, the art feels like it. These books are done in this sort of same style, and I kind of think that they're trying to, like, maybe meet eventually. So I don't, I don't know if that's their ultimate plan. But what I do know is, is Brian Michael Bendis good at writing Batman? He's, he's pretty good at it. I, I mean, it's not, it's not Tom King's Batman, which to me right now is my favorite Batman, but it was a pretty good showing. And, and more, you know, I, I like seeing Tom King write Superman, so I, I wonder if they're going to, like, fully switch at one point. Because I would love yeah, to see that. that. I would totally love to see that. So anyways, okay. Batman Universe, uh, I actually like this book a lot better than I did the first book. Because the first book felt, uh, well, I mean, it was something that was happening, but it just felt like uh, Riddler does a caper and Batman's chasing him down. That's it. And so this sort of picks up, and there's a little bit of mystery to what's going on, and there's some new players. Well, not new players. New old players in this game. Uh, and more importantly, you get to see Green Arrow team up with Batman, which is always fun. Uh, so yeah, Batman Universe number two, much better than the first book. And I'm having a really good time with it. So, yeah, it's a pretty good showing. Go pick it up. Next is Event Leviathan. And uh, last issue left us on a cliffhanger because it looked like Red Hood was... Uh, he was accused as being Leviathan by Damian Wayne. And that pretty much all the heroes in the DC... Not all of them, but a giant portion of heroes in the DC Universe were lined up on a rooftop, and uh, including most of the Bat family. And they all tried to jump Red Hood. And, and I think Batman says, like, don't run. And, you know, Jason's like, you taught me how to do this. <laughs> and, and so it picks up with this. And as a Red Hood fan, I got to tell you, I'm trying not to spoil it. But it's awesome. That's okay. all I'm going to say. <laughs> it was really cool. So, uh, Event Leviathan, you totally need to go read this book. Like, it started off, the first issue was like, meh, it was okay. I, I was kind of into it. The second issue, I was fully on board because of the ambush of Jason Todd, Red Hood. Yeah. And this issue was awesome. I'm having the best time with Event Leviathan. And I remember I was on the fence about the art. And I'm still kind of on the fence about the art. I don't know what it is. It's like... It is watercolor, it looks like, but at times it doesn't. Like, it's a weird style. But um, I'm, I'm more on board with this now. Like, it's, it's started to really appeal to me. So Event Leviathan was a slow burn, but uh, issue, issue three and maybe issue two. Go pick up issue two. Issue two was great. So go pick these both up. I need to clear my throat. Uh, Event Leviathan number three, go check it out. It's great. Uh, more importantly, we're going to find out who Leviathan is soon, I think. I mean, we're halfway through, right? Mm-hmm. But yeah, not Red Hood. That's all. <laughs> I mean, it still could be. I don't know. Um, Batman and the Outsiders is our next book. And this is, oh, Slice of Death as opposed to Slice of Life. Uh, so um, this pretty much picked up where one of the members of the Outsiders got kidnapped by Ra's al Ghul. It's pronounced Ra's. Anyone who pronounces it Raish is wrong. Um, and uh, anyway, so he got, they, they got kidnapped by Ra's al Ghul, and he pretty much is training her to fight for him as an assassin. And meanwhile, the rest of the Outsiders have to sort of deal with that and figure out how to get her back. And uh, of all people, Duke Thomas uh, had a scare and is now sort of struggling with his uh, limitations after uh, dealing with that. And so we're coming to see that. And Duke Thomas is one of my favorite characters, so I, I, I like seeing him grow like this. So Batman and the Outsiders... I gotta tell you, if if I wasn't as big a Bat Family fan as I was, I probably wouldn't be on board with this book. It's there's there's not a lot to anyone who is not into the Bat Family. But if you like Bat Family stuff and you like Batman stuff, you probably are fully on board. Or Black Lightning. I do like Black Lightning too. And I think if you like those characters, you should probably jump in here. If you're anyone else, don't jump in on this book. Uh, jump in on maybe the last book or I don't know. A book later, maybe, but uh, I don't. I don't know that issue four is the thing for you. So, is it a good book? As a Bat Family fan, yeah, it's okay. Um, as anyone else, I think you should pick a different book to jump in on. Um, next is Usagi Yojimbo, 
And uh, we, we talked about this last time. Like, every time that this character is in play, it has to do with, like, uh, demon hunting. And if there are specific characters in the Usagi universe that whenever they pop up on the, uh, the book cover, you know that it's either a detective story, you know that it's a, an action story, or you know that it's a paranormal story. This guy is the paranormal guy. And uh, this one plays out at times like watching a Jedi story, a Star Wars Jedi story. And it was really cool to see that. Like, the first two were just, like, straight horror. But the third one... At times, I mean, like, there was almost a legitimate lightsaber in this. And and it felt like uh, this character was, was at times sort of teaching Usagi. And even, like, the bad guys, like, commented on it, like, are you going to take over for a demon hunter? And, oh. and oh, it was so cool. So, is that happening in this issue? No, I don't think he's taking over for a demon hunter. But um, it might be setting the stage. And maybe these Star Wars references are for good reason. I don't know. You'll have to wait through the rest of our interview to see. But uh, Stan Sakai, Usagi Yojimbo number three. I'm a huge Usagi fan, so believe me, I'm totally biased when I tell you this. But if you love these kind of stories, you like Akira Kurosawa, uh, samurai films, and those kind of wandering ronin type stories, you will totally love the Usagi. You need to get on board. If you like TMNT, you'll love Usagi. Uh, but yeah, Bill, good, good show. Good show. It's wrapping up the first, I, I guess, the first story arc. So it was only three issues. Which Usagi can go, yeah, 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 it's an ongoing, but like Usagi can sort of they can do like a short story for just a few issues, and then no joke, Sakai will do like a 12 to like 18 issue story and like a giant story arc, and then he'll bring it back to like you know just a few issues for a story arc. So, uh, it kind of goes back and forth, yeah. So, yeah, good showing. Hey, our next book is Miles Morales Spider Man, and we bought a lot of these because they've been so good lately. Um, so the last issue, uh, we had Miles Morales kidnapped, and he was kidnapped by, it was sort of, it seemed like an AI, but it wasn't fully explained if somebody was behind the helms, but it was testing him and putting him through scenarios and sort of messing with his head. Like, at times, it would seem like he was escaping, and then it turned out it was all, like, a part of the, I don't want to call it the danger room, but it felt like the danger room AI at times. Um... So it was, it was experimenting on him, and we didn't have much of an explanation. And we still don't, because I think that that's going to be a longer story arc than this book. However, what was really cool to see in this book is the people that come together to rescue him are his dad, who is X-Shield, and uh, his uncle Aaron. Oh. So we get to see a Prowler fight yeah. in the middle of it, and it was a good, good showing. So Miles Morales' Spider-Man uh, issue number nine, go check this out. This one was really fun. Uh, I had a great time with it. Uh, so Marvel fans, jump in. And DC fans, if you want something that's pretty good, uh, Miles Morales, Spider-Man, you really can't go wrong with this. If you want to dip your toes in some Marvel, you know, I, you never know. Next is another Marvel book that was pretty darn good this week. And that was Powers of X, issue number two. Now, I'm holding up the Scotty Young variant because we're sold out of the mainline comic. I think we have one. We have one for the shelf. Um... So we have had a ton of subscribers because uh, Hickman's X-Men has been just awesome. Like nothing short of awesome. And he's redefining everything. We come to find out that, uh, who was it? What was her name? Moira? Do you remember? It was Moira. So she's a, she was a mutant that uh, when she died, she retained her knowledge and she, oh, was, yeah. she was reborn. And more importantly, she was reborn across like all of the different timelines. And so each time she sort of was one of the players and trying to figure out like, is this the way we, we ensure that mutants survive? And then she'd die, and then it would go on to the next timeline, and then she'd die. And so for this specific one, she decided that she was going to change everything and immediately go to Xavier and have him read her mind and get all her knowledge at once. So she has given him all of the knowledge, and because of it, that particular Professor X is different. He's totally different from the rest of the Professor X's. He's, he's different from his usual motif. He's a little more radical, and that shows in this book. They make it a point to show how different he is. And, in fact, I, th I think we talked about how in the House of X, uh, the issue one, his offer seemed a little creepy at times. Like, he offered the, the other nations, like, I will give you a pill that will, like, extend your life. I'll give you a pill that will cure the ailments of your brain. And there was one other pill. Um... <clears throat> But he said, you have to see Krakoa as its own nation, and you have to, only mutants can go there. 
humans cannot go up go there but you have to recognize it and i was like that seems creepy and magneto was like fully on board with all of this which tends to be a little creepy um but it, it, it seems even more creepy in this book and you need to go read powers of x issue 2 to find out why I, I think issue one was like about the timelines and a lot of it centered around nimrod which is a funny name, but not one of my favorite characters. He's like the, the future robot that just chases humans or mutants around. Um, and so this picks up, and it touches up on more of that stuff too. But people riding skateboards in the mall for like no reason. Um, anyways, this was a good showing. Um, it's a different Professor X. It's a totally different. And even Magneto in this, one point in this book says like, uh, you need to be different, and if you if you aren't different, then I'm gonna know, and I might take action against you. So yeah, good showing. Powers of X issue number two. Go pick this one up. This one is a great show. This was this was honestly after House of X issue number one. This was my second favorite. So uh, okay, we're good. Okay. Next is Fantastic Four, issue number thirteen, and this is in one second the Immortal Hulk will kill him unless. Yeah, so this is part two to the Immortal Hulk fight. Uh, the last one picked up with Ben Grimm. Uh, it was Ben Grimm was going on his honeymoon with his wife, and he had timed it so that the one time of the year where he turns human and sheds all his rocks uh, would be on his honeymoon, and he's got it ticked down to the last second. <laughs> Meanwhile, like one hour before, they get attacked by the Immortal Hulk at their honeymoon spot, and he's got to fight the Immortal Hulk off. And it turns out the Immortal Hulk is controlled by Puppet Master, who is actually his uh, new wife's father. So, yeah, um, that's where it picks up. And uh, the fight is great. The fight is great. But if you know something about these two characters, one, you know, the Hulk doesn't ever quit. He just gets more angry and more angry. And two, Ben Grimm has never lost a fight. Like, ever, I don't think. He's never lost a fight. He's pretty much, they should call him the unbeatable man at this point because Ben Grimm always wins a fight. Uh, does his record hold in this issue? I don't know. You need to go check it out and find out. But uh, yeah, Fantastic Four issue number 13 was a really good issue. The art's good. Um, the art's really good. The story's good. Uh, I mean, it was kind of, I knew it was going to happen from beginning to end at times, it felt like, but I didn't hate it. I, I loved it. As far as good comics go, the Fantastic Four stuff has been great lately. So go check that out. Next is Catwoman. And uh, who is writing this? It says V. I want to believe that's like Tinian the Fifth, but it just says V. I don't know who V is. Uh, <laughs> weird cover might be a possible misprint, but it says V is writing Catwoman. Uh, and uh, Andolfo and then Prianto. Um, really, honestly, this book feels like an extension of Tom King's Batman run. And uh, it centers around Catwoman, but her inner monologue feels exactly how the, the Catwoman I've known, come to know and love in Tom King's run is found here. She's betrayed by a bunch of thieves and a bunch of, she was hired to, to steal something. She's sort of betrayed. And meanwhile, a whole bunch of people are trying to assassinate her in her own city. That, that's, that doesn't make Catwoman happy. So uh, meanwhile, the whole time she's talking about, while she's dealing with all this stuff, she's talking about the things that, that Batman would say to her and, and how she'd respond. And she's doing sort of the dance, but she's doing it with herself. And it was a great showing. And I, I get it. I get it. They're accelerating towards that Bat and Cat storyline that's going to finish Tom King's run. But uh, if you like Batman on the shelf right now and you love Catwoman, uh, you need to go pick this up because this is just more of that, that goodness right now. So, uh, Catwoman issue 14, it was a good showing. Oh, there is a gentleman ghost in the DC universe. Have you ever heard of the gentleman ghost? <clears throat> he shows up, he's totally see-through, and he wears white, and he's got like a white top hat and a monocle. He's the gentleman ghost, uh, a character I never knew about and didn't know I would love. So I love that character. He was awesome. Um, next is The Flash, issue number 76. And, my God, has it really been 76 issues? It's been a while, and I think it's been a long time since I've read them, too. Like, this is a bi-weekly, and I think I've missed, like, I don't know, 20 or 30 issues. Yeah, the so, last one you did was year, uh, year one. Yeah, so this picks up with uh, uh, Batman and... I mean, Batman. <laughs> you got Batman on the brain. <laughs> this picks up with Flash, Kid Flash, and uh, a new character that I don't know that well called Avery. Clearly, I've missed out on a lot of stuff. But meanwhile, um, they're dealing with stuff, 
And then Flash has built a speed lab in Central City's museum that he's rebuilt. And, and more importantly, uh, in order to get in the speed lab, you have to be a speedster because you've got to phase through a wall. That is cool. Like, I, I have not seen enough stuff like that uh, involving the Flash. Like, uh, I, I'm all on board with the speed lab. And maybe I've missed it before. I, I've never really been su like a super like a big flash reader up until rebirth but that was really cool to see um <clears throat> they find out some stuff about the speed force and there's a still force character in this issue and and there is black death whenever black death appears a speedster dies and he's in this issue so does that mean a speedster is gonna die i don't know you're gonna have to come by flash number 76 and find out uh it was pretty cool to see though um yeah so, I need to do some coffee real fast. Next issue is <clears throat> Silver Surfer Black. And my god, <clears throat> we really need to call this Silver Surfer Psychedelic. Or, yeah, it's very yellow submarine, man. it is very yellow submarine. I think there was even like a Blue Meanies reference at one point, but. It, 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 yeah, it feels like that. It feels like, I don't know, I partied too hard in the 90s is what the, the book should be called. Uh, the art is just out of control. And I think the last issue picked up where, um, oh, he, he winds up near, being near Ego, the living planet, and he's got to deal with stuff. And uh, in this issue, Ego is sort of, <clears throat> well, he's, ha he's got a health issue, and Silver Surfer's got to figure that out. Meanwhile, he's like navigating Null. He's fighting Null because he accidentally released Null. And then his arm is getting blacker and blacker. And is that a symbiote in him? I don't know. Because wow. Noah was locked up on the symbiote planet, so it would make sense. But I don't know. It's not talking to him. Huh. But yeah. So he's slowly losing power. He's, he's losing a, a lot of cosmic power. He's kind of dying. Meanwhile, he's trying to save Ego. This is a really, really fun psychedelic weird read it, it, honestly if you like what it, what it feels like to me is it feels like a lot of that old doctor strange where it just got really wild and weird with the art that's what this feels like so if you like that sort of thing you will love this uh if you like silver surfer you'll love this i mean uh, god knows we have plenty of silver surfer fans in the store right seems like people snatch these up so silver surfer black issue number three go check this out if you've uh liked any of the past issues if you just like silver surfer in general you really can't go wrong with it <clears throat> Next is Wonder Woman, stalked by Cheetah. And, uh, you know, we, we hadn't been reviewing Wonder Woman for a bit. It got a little weird for a while there. I don't know what was going on. Our man Mick Gray has been working on it. And uh, I don't know what was happening, though. It was getting kind of weird. This picks up with Steve Trevor sort of dealing with uh, Aphrodite and the, the goddess of beauty. I can't remember her name. Um, but, yeah, so he's kind of dealing with them. And then, you know... Sort of finds his way back into Wonder Woman's arms, and they go from there. And then Cheetah pops up, and I mean, is it a good issue? It's it's actually a great issue. It's much improved. This this is like the Wonder Woman I wanted, and I I mean, I need a little more action. There's not enough action in this issue, I will say. Uh, but it, does this feel like a lot of old Wonder Woman books that I've read in the past? Yeah, yeah, it does. It feels like they found their way again. I, I don't know what was going on a couple issues ago. What were they doing? They were trying to find, like, a uh, minotaur and... Uh, yeah, over in, like, Washington, D.C. or something. Trying to find him a new home or something. Yeah. And, yeah, it was kind of weird. Um, <clears throat> this is much improved. So Wonder Woman issue number 76. If you're a Wonder Woman fan, go pick this up. If you're a DC fan and you want to dip your toes in some Wonder Woman, this is a pretty good issue. So... <clears throat> Next is Black Hammer Justice League. Uh, what happened in the last issue? The Justice League got swapped with the Black Hammer characters. So the Justice League was on the farm, trapped on the farm. And the Black Hammer characters were uh, in uh, the DC mainline universe. And this picks up right after that. Uh, I think, although I do think time has passed like like longer for the DC characters. Because they've been in that farm for like, I think, I think they said like five years had passed or something. Um Meanwhile, in this storyline, the, the Black Hammer people are just encountering the rest of the Justice League and dealing with a very familiar and very loved first villain. Starro? Starro. Yeah. Starro, my man Starro is in this. Uh, so Black Hammer Justice League, it's great. It's honestly 
awesome. If you like Black Hammer, you will totally love this. If you like the Justice League, you will totally love this. Uh, you need to jump on board because this is a really, really fun ride, and I can't wait to see where they go with this. They have Colonel Weird in this. Do you remember Colonel Weird, the space guy that was, like, flipping in and out of time and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Guess who he goes and finds okay. in the middle of space? What do you think Colonel Weird would encounter in the middle of space? Probably, yeah, and that seems like a perfect thing, like Colonel Weird cruising around with the lantern and stuff like that. So, uh, honestly, there. Granted, it seems like fan service, maybe, but Jeff Lemire and Michael Wash and Nate Picos, they clearly know the material, they know the characters, and they know what the fans want because this was awesome. It was great, and yeah, yeah, it's Dark Horse. It's not mainline DC, but it was great. Um, <clears throat> Next is Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man. And this has that old lady in it that's like an assassin. That every time I see her in Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man, like, I know it's going to be a good issue. Because she's she just puts on this mask and she starts, like, kicking butt. And she's just a beast. And she's very blunt. Like, she, she tells Parker what he needs to do, like, at the moment of action and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, she's in this issue. I can't remember her name, but whenever she's in an issue, it's great. Um, so this one does center partially around the Prowler, who is actually Peter Parker's new roommate. Yeah, he's been a roommate in Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man. Iron Man's in this. On top of that, you get that crazy lady assassin. I can't remember her name. It's going to drive me nuts. But uh, yeah, this issue was great. Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man, I was kind of on the fence about for the first few issues. But uh, by issue 10, uh, well before this actually, I think that the Cancer Kid issue was like, my favorite that one hit me hard um but yeah friendly neighborhood spider-man is a great great showing by taylor lashley hannah uh maresca and wood woodard um friendly neighborhood spider-man issue number 10 go check it out if you're a marvel fan next is dr strange do you remember a few issues back when galactus got transported to a magical realm and started eating up magic and it was messing with like the laws of physics and everything else and then Doctor Strange, I think, killed Galactus. Apparently, that messed up everything. Like, completely destroyed the universe to the point where, like, it had reset. Like a, like a hard reset. And meanwhile, Doctor Strange had made a deal with Mephisto that if anything happened in the future because of what he had done, that he would put it right. So, we've got Doctor Strange in this issue, and he has to operate on reality. Wow, like, if, if ever there was a psychedelic and crazy Doctor Strange storyline that should be done, like, it's this, and it was cool. Uh, we, we get all the cosmic characters, like, there is, um, what's his name, the, um, the three-faced dude? Oh, the Living Tribunal. The, the Living Tribunal is in it. Uh, we have a sort of counter, cosmic counter to Doctor Strange, like a crazy mask, I can't remember what that's called. Um. We have Galactus, you know, um, we have, like, pretty much all of his villains. It goes over a lot of stuff. It felt, uh, honestly, it felt like a, a course in Marvel history at times. But it was a really, really fun and cool showing and a great way to wrap up that other event. Now, do you need to be caught up on the books to, like, know what's going on? It, uh, maybe, I don't know. I wasn't too confused and I've missed a few issues. But, I, honestly, it's a pretty good showing. And go figure, it's Mark Wade. So, uh, Mark Wade, uh, Barry Kitson, uh, Scott Kublish, and uh, Brian Reber, uh, Doctor Strange is a good, good showing. One thing I will say is they swapped out the artist from on Doctor Strange, and there was a different artist a few issues back that, honestly, <clears throat> I kind of identified with a little better. Um, but this artist is, is perfectly good, and honestly, it feels like a Doctor Strange art. It's very psychedelic at times. Almost. So, yeah, um, Doctor Strange, issue number 17 is a good, good showing by Mark Wade. Go check it out. Uh, next is, I keep saying go check it out. <laughs> is that it's kind of weird. Catch no, that's not a good catchphrase. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, anyways, the next book is Conan the Barbarian Exodus. Um, Marvel is betting deep on Conan these days. It seems like we have like 10 Conan books. Uh, is this a good showing? Yes. There is no words in this book. None whatsoever, but it tells a really good Conan adventure. And if you know if you know Conan, you know that they can do that, and they do do that sort of often. There are there are whole issues where he's just fighting stuff and dealing with stuff, and that's the story. And it this is one of those issues. It's a good showing. Uh, the art is wow. The art was great for a Conan book. 
I really, really liked the art. Um, uh, the story was pretty fun. Um, it wasn't confusing even without words. It was just, you know, typical fantasy and struggle and survival type story for Conan. And it was good. It was really good. It says, all new saga from visionary creator Aesop Ribic. So, uh, yeah, Conan the Barbarian Exodus. I wish I could give the artist cr more credit. But, oh, here it is. Aesop uh, Ribic is the writer, artist, and cover artist. Oh, my God. Well, good job, dude. You wow. Good show. <laughs> so, Conan the Barbarian Exodus. Um... I, I wouldn't say it's the strongest Conan title right now. Um, Conan the Barbarian is a little better, in my opinion. I just like Conan the Barbarian so much. But as far as art goes, this knocks it out of the park. And it might be the strongest Conan title. I had a pretty good time with this book. So go check it out. We're back, and we're doing Gwenpool Strikes Back. Um, so this comic, it's, it's, it's a Deadpool comic. Let's talk about Gwenpool for a second. Gwenpool is named Gwendolyn Poole, and... Her storyline, obviously she's a combination of Spider-Gwen and, uh, and Deadpool, but that's not technically her storyline. She's Her name is Gwendolyn Poole, and she's from our universe, and she got sucked into 616, and so she's constantly living in fear of being retconned or written out of history. Um, is this book funny? Yeah, it was terribly funny. Um, there is honestly like her high school photo uh, scene where she shows it to Peter Parker, and he's like, why, why are you like this? <laughs> like, it's great. But you should know that when you get this book, you're pretty much getting a Deadpool book. Now, she's trying to figure out her power set and figure out what she can do uh, and how it involves breaking the fourth wall and everything else. And hopefully how it makes her a little bit different from Deadpool, because I'd like to see that. But um, if you're a Deadpool fan, you'll be perfectly at home with this. If you need a little madcap in your life and Marvel stuff, not not actual madcap. That's He's an actual character. <laughs> um but if you need some uh, mad cappiness, um, Gwenpool is a pretty good showing. So, yeah, Gwenpool Strikes Back, issue number one. We have plenty of copies. Come pick it up. Uh, <clears throat> next is Loki. And Loki was amazing. This book was great. It was so good. Uh, Loki, issue number one, I had a pretty good time with. Uh, it was basically his, he had killed his father, so he was now king of, what's the name? Jo Jotunheim? Jotunheim. So he was king of the frost giants, and he didn't like that, so he went off gambling, and sort of <laughs> dealt with that, and then Thor sort of reined him in and was like, look, you need to be you. And here, let me read you from the books of Loki in this magic library that I found. And that's pretty much where this book takes off. So what does Loki do? He decides that he's going to go to Tony Stark and ask him to be an Avenger. Ah. <laughs> why? I, I don't know why. Um, uh, it's great. He goes to him. He's wearing like a shirt that says Loki, L-O-W-K-E-Y. Perfect shirt. I, I don't know. It's the writing's great. I honestly I didn't know that Loki could be a main character. I worried that he was just too much of a comedic relief that he couldn't carry the story. They, he he's written so well. He carries the story great. So Kibble Smith and Bazalda and Kirill, Loki issue number 2 is awesome. Uh, Loki stocks are going through the roof right now. But uh, yeah, get get Loki. Issue number 2 is great. It's a really 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 super good show. Buy Loki stocks. Sell Titan stocks. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Loki is great. Go check this out. Uh, next is Unearth. So Unearth was the sort of fantasy-like aliens is what it felt like. It's aliens with giant centipedes and fantasy references is what it seems like entirely. And this is no different. This, this, this book is very clearly an aliens clone. I, I mean, they're, they're pretty blatant in it. I keep waiting for something to be different, and it's really not. It just it <laughs> feels like <clears throat> it, it just feels like the art is a little different, but it's an H.R. Geiger thing. Um, anyway, so this is Cullen Bunn, Kyle Strom, uh, Baldemir Rivas, and Crank. Crank? This guy's name is Crank with an exclamation mark? Oh. Okay. Crank. Uh, I guess is the cover artist. Now, uh, being an Aliens clone and being so blatant of an Aliens clone, was it terrible? No, it was kind of fun. If you like action and you sort of like that whole cornered, worried uh, humans that are being hunted type feeling, then you will be perfectly at home with uh, Unearth. Uh, but that's what it feels like. You're not getting much difference here. It's just sort of humans dealing with aliens and scrambling to like save their own lives. 
that's it. So issue number two, uh, pretty good showing. Um, the art is great. I, I won't lie. The art is amazing. The writing is not terrible. It's just not... <clears throat> it's something we've seen. And that's all I'm going to say. So Unearth issue number two. If you like sci-fi, go pick it up. <clears throat> My throat is going, man. I hope I can hold out. <laughs> Almost there. Almost there. Next is Age of Conan Valeria. This centers around Valeria the Swordswoman. Um, she is, I, I think she's trying, this is her origin story, and she's trying to be the best swordswoman in all of Aquaria, I think is it's what it's called. I can't ever get these, uh, Hyborian names correct. Although I just did get Hyboria correct, didn't wow. I? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's basically, it's her story, how her parents got killed because everyone's parents get brutally killed in the Conan universe. Uh, how her brother got killed because everyone's brother gets brutally killed in the Conan universe. And, uh, yeah, how, what she's doing for vengeance because everyone goes for vengeance in the Conan universe. So when you're not dealing with the blood god in the Conan universe, because everyone's dealing with the blood god at some point, um, you need to watch out for your loved ones because they always get murdered violently. So don't be a parent in that universe. That's pretty much it. So, Age of Conan Valeria. Is it tropey? Yeah, it's a little tropey, but uh, it's good fantasy still. Um, all the Age of Conan stuff is pretty good fantasy. And Meredith Finch, uh, Aniki, and Andy Troy. Granted, I, I mean, it's a first issue. First issues are supposed to be a little bit telegraphed and a little bit tropey at first. Um, and then th the characters change from there. So, I don't know. I didn't hate it. I love the art. Uh, the storyline was... It was so-so. But it's still a pretty good storyline. So if you like fantasy, come pick this up. Next is Silver Surfer, the Prodigal Son. So we had a character named Prodigal who uh, <clears throat> teamed up. I guess he sort of teamed up with the Fantastic Four, but sort of fought them. And Kazar was the last issue. And that was Prodigal Son, Fantastic Four, Kazar, which is a weird crossover. So I, I'm surmising. I don't know anything about this character. I don't. Th I think it's a new character, but I, don't quote me. But uh, he basically went up against Kazar, and even though he's supposed to be an unbeatable character, kind of got beat at times. So uh, Prodigal Son is a super powerful character, and his dad gives him the task of m helping a planet and ensuring that this planet is safe. And when he gets over there, uh, it turns out Galactus and Silver Surfer have shown up. And so he decides he's going to take on Galactus and Silver Surfer because he's so OP. And, you know, I, I don't know. Did I identify with the storyline? Not really. Um, I, honestly, th this character, it did seem like it humanized the character more. But really, by the time we got to the end of the story, it humanized Silver Surfer more is what it felt like. Now, does that mean it's a terrible character? No. I, I actually do want to know more about this character. Um, the Kazar book was the one where I didn't care for him at all. And didn't, like, it just wasn't a story I identified with at all. This one was a bit better, and I'm, I'm kind of finding I'm more attached to the character. I just don't like his ego, because he's just like, oh, I'm undefeatable. You don't call yourself undefeatable in this world. You just, that's not something you do. That's asking yeah, that's asking for trouble. There are some almost undefeatable characters in that world. I mean, Ben Grimm. Yep, yep. But, uh, but yeah, you don't call yourself that. But Prodigal Son... Uh, it's kind of a newer character. It's not really one that I've identified with yet. But is this a terrible show? No, it's not. Um, the art was really, really good. Uh, honestly, the art was amazing at times. Um, the storyline was, well, it was so-so. I broke it down for you, and if you like it, you, you know who you are. And if not, well, I'm sorry. Um, but we've got issue number one. They're leading into another thing with Prodigal Son. So I kind of do think you need to get on board because I think he's going to hook up with the Guardians is what it feels like. And I think that's a perfect place for him to go, honestly. So Prodigal Son, Silver Surfer by Peter David, uh, Francesco uh, Mana, Espen Guttigern. I'm sorry, I'm bad with names. <laughs> but yeah, go check this out. Issue number one. It's, it's really, it's a one shot. Next to Star Wars Adventures. And if you remember, I said that uh, maybe there was a Jedi reference in Yusagi and maybe it was on purpose. And that's because guess who uh, did one of these stories in this very thick Star Wars Adventures? And that was illustration. Stan Sakai. I, I don't think he just did illustration. I think he wrote the story too because it awesome. felt like a Sakai story. Uh, but yeah, so Stan Sakai did this, uh, part of this. 
And this issue, more importantly, it feels like it's seven ninety nine. So go figure. It's like the size of a trade paperback, and it, it's a pretty good showing. It's three separate stories. They don't really interact, but one of the characters, the one that Sakai does, feels like Bucky O'Hare is what it felt like, and I think it was intentional. Like he even kind of looks like Bucky O'Hare. So uh, yeah, Star Wars Adventures, uh, the the twenty nineteen annual seven ninety nine. It's a giant book, and if you if you like the Star Wars kids stuff, go check this out. It's a pretty good read. Next was an amazing read. I mean, I don't know. Maybe we should make this pick of the week because I had such a fun time with it. But I like, I like, I like Jerry Duggan. Um, and that was Punisher Kill Crew. It was amazing because of well, one, it sort of humanizes uh, Frank Castle a bit. So Frank made a promise to a guy who's also named Frank. His name is like Frank uh, Frank Jones, I think it is. Frank Jones' whole family got killed. Got killed in the War of the Realms, and they're just dead. And so he promises, uh, Frank promises that he'll go kill the thing that killed his family. And meanwhile, Frank Jones is like, well, well, Punisher goes to rush into the other realms. And then it turns out that Doctor Strange casted a spell that doesn't let anyone born on Earth go into the other realms. So and he's like, sorry, man, you can't go do that. And so, uh, you know, Frank's not really one to give up. Well, actually, he almost was. He went to Frank Jones and he's like, sorry, man, I, I don't have any way to get to the other realms. And Frank Jones is like, well... You know, let me introduce you to my friends. And Frank's like, well, I, I don't like meeting friends. And he, like, opens up a van and there's all these kids that got killed. Like, or their parents got killed. So they're just orphans from the War of the Realms. And, and, and so one of the kids is like, I want pizza. So Frank's like, well, I can't say no to an orphan kid. So he takes him out for pizza. And then he's like, one of the kids is like, this is the thing that killed my mom. And he's got a drawing of it. And so meanwhile, Frank's like, write, draw pictures of everything that, that, that hurt your family. And I will go handle it. And so all these kids like draw him these pictures and he like leaves. And it turns out some of the War of the Realm stuff is still hiding in the Marvel Universe. So he starts hunting them on Earth. Oh, wow. And that's when he finds Thor's goat and goes from there. And we know how that <laughs> happens. Look, I'm, I'm going to, it's, it's have goat will travel is how they've advertised this. So clearly he's using the goat to get to the other realms. But uh, yeah. Punisher Kill Crew. You know most of the storyline. I'm kind of sorry for it, but was it great? It was awesome. It was so good. I mean, granted, I'm a Punisher fan, but I had the funnest time with this storyline, and I, I can't wait to watch Frank wreck all this stuff. So Punisher Kill Crew, uh, this is Jerry Duggan and Juan Ferreria. Uh, go check this out. It was a really, really good read. Uh, next is, well, this one was a great read, too. It's hard to pick, man, this week. It's hard to pick a favorite. Um... Justice League Odyssey. So what do we know? Uh, the world of new gods and uh, Apocalypse were destroyed. Yes. Uh, Darkseid had left a contingency in the ghost sector. Um, the Justice League Odyssey got trapped in the ghost sector. Uh, they couldn't get out. Meanwhile, Justice Le uh, Darkseid was uh, launching his Sepulchre, I think it's called, which will essentially build a new Apocalypse, establish uh, the new gods for Apocalypse, and then take them out of the playing field so they won't be technically in the universe's reality. So that they can't be destroyed when the multiverse gets destroyed because the source walls fall off. Um, and that's pretty much the storyline where it picks up. Now, uh, while they were going along, Justice League was going on, they come to find out that most of them had been infected by something that Darkseid had given them. And was turning them into like these, these uh, dark, basically apocalypse gods. And so that's where this picks up. And... Uh, the only one, one or two of them are left standing that, that aren't infected, and that pits them against the rest of them. And that's, that's all I'm going to say. This is a good read. It was awesome. It was awesome. Like, if you've been reading most of this, like, it's kind of come full circle. But, uh, it's, I mean, it's dark side being dark side. And uh, someone, something pretty catastrophic happens in this, and that's all I'm going to say. So Justice League Odyssey issue number 12 was awesome. Go pick this up for sure. And that's our show for the week. Yay. So, yeah, we don't have a drawing this week because we oh. ran out of posters. So when we get more posters, we'll do another drawing. And that's, that's it. <laughs>